Some people that are watching this may be young enough that they didn't live through the days of Napster. Which is too bad, because Napster was a kind of a unique moment in the history of the relationship between the music industry and the internet. So when I was in college, first couple years I was in college, um, I spent some time downloading uh, content on the internet I was supposed to, specifically MP3s. So this was very early on, it's like 1998, 1999. And at the time, if you wanted MP3s, there were these FTP sites that you could log on to, and sometimes they had things, and sometimes they didn't. Sometimes you had to go through this long and ugly sign-up process to get access to these MP3s. Um, and then at some point, I think maybe my sophomore, junior year, Napster comes along. And Napster was, in theory, a peer-to-peer -peer music sharing service. They had centralized indexes, if I remember correctly. So there, was, there were centralized sites where they would hold lists of songs and who had those songs. But then once you use that to find out who had a particular MP3, uh, the transfer of the MP3 between your two computers was done directly. And so that gave Napster some legal coverage when they started to get in hot water claiming, well, they weren't actually, uh, the, the copyrighted content was actually never flowing through their servers, they were just serving as sort of an index and allowing people to make these exchanges. So Napster made it very, very easy to find and download MP3s online. And there were a lot of people that got involved with this and started to use Napster to share music with each other. Um, now obviously the music that was being exchanged was copyrighted and the exchanges were illegal. And Napster knew about this, despite the fact, you know, they had this fig leaf of, oh, well, a certain amount of percent of music that's being exchanged on Napster is, is outside of copyright. Um, and eventually, uh, Napster sort of uh, faced enough legal liability that the site was shut down. Um, it, it sort of, uh, it, it seems like it's trying to reincarnate. So this is the current Napster site, us.napster.com. So it, it's sort of trading on the name now and, and trying to reincarnate itself as a streaming music um, music site, um, but this that was sort of that's sort of the story of Napster. Now, the interesting thing about Napster is is sort of where you, what what how you feel about Napster's effect on the music industry. So we might you know put some pros and cons here. So cons uh, clearly you know clearly illegal music trading. I mean, there is no doubt about this. No one no one will try to argue that Napster was primarily used for legitimate content. That's clearly false. Um, it was being used for illegitimate content. Now, the question that occurred was, however, what effect did Napster have on music sales? And this is interesting because, to some degree, um, one of the things that was good about Napster was it exposed people to new music. Music that they wouldn't have necessarily heard. So there were a lot of artists that got exposure on Napster, ended up doing you know somewhat well that weren't being played on the radio, that might not have had a big record uh, a record deal with a major label that would allow them to get the airplay that they needed to get promoted. Um, and so on some level, I think Napster was the first sort of crack in the edifice of a much larger and to some degree not internet ready music publishing business that still relied on um, sort of creating stars from the top down, finding people and sort of injecting them with musical abilities and then pushing them out sort of these um, pop stars that were almost like laboratory creations rather than kind of trying to build a bottom up approach where you actually listen to what people want. And when people started to be able to find music online, um, they found a lot more music that they liked. And it's also possible that this actually led to more sales. So the question is, what effect did Napster have on music, on music sales? And this is something that you can debate. Uh, because some people will say, well, clearly people were acquiring music online that they would have had to pay for normally. Other people would say people were discovering music online and then they would buy the CDs because they wanted you know, to play it in their CD player or they wanted the album art. They would go to concerts for bands that they hadn't gone to before, generating a new stream of revenue. Um, from my perspective, you know, as, as somebody who grew up sort of and saw Napster come and go and then saw what replaced Napster, uh, more pure peer-to-peer -peer, um, music streaming services that didn't have any centralized control and were much harder for the recording industries to attack, um, I think, I'm, I mean, one of the, the persistent, um, I think, lessons of Napster was that people wanted to buy songs. 
Um, the music industry before that had a model where, you know, if there was one hit song on an album, you had to go and you had to buy the CD, there was $10 or $12 or $15. And Napster made it clear that people didn't want that. That was something that people brought up. There was an irritation about the model of the music business, was that they had to buy these large chunks of content. Um, and I think, you know, as, as you looked at what replaced Napster in the, the sort of ecosystem of the music industry now, iTunes makes it possible to buy tracks one at a time, and they're quite cheap. And so, you know, I think Napster opened up new ways for the music industry to think about packaging its content. Um, and, you know, it also, you know, had an effect on how some of the artists made money. Some artists were very supportive of Napster. There were music artists that were actively supportive of this platform because they felt that it helped them reach their fans. It helped bring people to concerts. It helped sell merchandise. And some of those revenue streams actually, at least in my understanding, tend to benefit the bands more than album sales where the money gets passed through a lot of different middlemen. So, you know, clearly this was the first sort of set the stage for a, a much larger and longer and more complicated relationship between the music industry and the internet. Um, today, you know, I don't know if we've reached some sort of detente where there's people like me that pay a certain amount for all-you-can-eat music services, other people get it for free with some advertising mixed in. Um, there's clearly more of an appreciation for the role of touring and merchandise and things like that. You have bands like Radiohead that have decided to put their album online and let people pay whatever they want for it. You know, and I think that to some degree, you know, Napster and the early rise of peer-to-peer -peer music sharing set the stage for a lot of this sort of interesting evolution of how we find music, how we listen to music, and how we support the people that make music.